choir. Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. My name is Laura Keith King, and my pronouns are she and her. <coughs> Please silence your cell phones. We want to take a few minutes this morning to welcome any guests we have with us today. We're so glad you're here. We used to make you all stand up and introduce yourselves, but we don't do that anymore. We hope you will join us for refreshments. And we are having a reception, a goodbye and thank you reception for Reverend Alice after the service. So please stay and join us for that and eat cake. <laughs> if you are new to the church and you would like to receive communications about us, which would be an email about once a week, Please complete a guest card, which sounds like, looks like this, <coughs> found on the credenza. You may return these to the greeters or leave them on the credenza 
or put them in the offering basket when the basket comes around. We do not have a written order of service, but you each should have been, re, um, should have been provided with a folding document that has information about us, as well as a form for any joys and sorrows you may want to share. Please place any of those written out joys or sorrows into the offering basket during our collection and they will be read later in the service. When leaving the service, please return the cover document to the basket at the back of the sanctuary as we reuse them. But if you want one to take home, we have some made of plain paper that are on the credenza and we welcome you to take those home as they do have all our contact information and the words that we say each week, etc. I'm watching the nicest kisses back there. <laughs> we have a couple of announcements. In July and August, the social justice team will be collecting paper towels and toilet paper for youth transitioning out of homelessness. And if you notice, there's a good size collection started, but we're going to keep on collecting through August. We are also looking for new or gently used standing shelves to help organize items for the youths, youth. To donate, drop paper products in the basket in the lobby during July and August. If you have shelves, please contact Lauren and Zaldo to arrange for delivery. And Lauren is... There she is. <laughs> she has a shirt on that says rebel. <laughs> Those items will benefit the youth in the street outreach program and the Empower House of Children's Home Society, who we collected coats and blankets for this past winter. We also have an announcement from Daniel, if Daniel's ready to come up. There he is. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? As I'm sure a lot of you are aware, one of the opportunities that we have within our church community to come together and provide some services is the janitorial services. We find ourselves with a bit of a shortfall there, but that's okay because Michael has generously agreed to donate his time to do our monthly cleanings. Um, yes. So what we need now is we need individuals who are willing to help on a weekly basis. I estimate that these services would take between 30 and 45 minutes and can be completed after services on Sunday. Uh, we're going to be putting a sign out, a sign up sheet as well as a responsibility list out uh, starting next week. So we'll create a little calendar and if you would care to help us keep everything clean and make Michael's life a little bit easier, then we would all certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. And several people have mentioned to me, several people, like half a dozen or more, about our grass, the mowing of the grass. We are working on it. It will get better, I promise. So, those are our announcements for today. And we move on to the chalice lighting. Let astonishment be possible by the Reverend Gretchen Haley. Whatever you have come in anticipating, whatever you expect or worry for our world, for the future, for our lives, let it go. Make space in your heart to be surprised. Make room in your soul for a new story to take shape. Let astonishment be possible. At this life that remains a miracle, imagine here the bursting of joy.
Well, good morning. It's been a little while since I've been here. I've been on my study leave and vacation. And then I got sick, and now I'm here to say hello and goodbye. <laughs> so um, it's wonderful to be here with you, and I am also feeling some sadness knowing that my time as your minister is coming to a close, and I have so loved being part of this community and serving you as minister. I, was, I said I was gonna talk about joy today because our UUA president said that we absolutely have to have joy in our lives. It's um, important fuel for all that we do. And so if you were listening to the chalice words this morning, you heard about joy. So I'm just going to see if we can make sure that we, we are here with some joy in our hearts today, even though it feels like a sad day. Um, and maybe what you can do is get in touch with some place in your life where you find joy. I always find it with my grandchildren. If you're a grandparent, then that may be the case for you. Um, maybe you walked in this morning and, and saw a good friend that you hadn't seen for a while, or maybe somebody just smiled at you and made your heart feel good. Maybe there's a, a special person in your life that brings you joy or special activities in your life that bring you joy. But just for a moment, go there. Um, and if you can't seem to find that today, then have some hope that maybe it comes to you some place in this morning that we spend together, that there will be a, a moment of joy that you will be able to hold on to and say, you know, it's hard sometimes, and our country's in a hard place, and we have to sometimes work a little harder. To, to stay in touch with the fact that we're here, we have a wonderful opportunity to make changes and to be with one another, and, um, and we have a right to feel joy. We just, let's just go there for just a minute. And hang on to that as we move through today in the service, and then we'll have more joy when we get together <laughs> to celebrate our time together with one another. I invite you to rise as your body or spirit allow as we say the words to our church covenant. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is law. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. And now we have our opening hymn, Gathered Here. It's number 389 if you want to look in the book. Sing it together. Um, yeah. Gathered here, rounds it twice. Right? Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in one strong body. Gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spirit, draw me. 
one time, and then this half of us will stop until, the, and these guys will keep going, and when they come to the second gather here, that's when we start. With the first gather here. Yes, if you look at your hymn book, it's a little number, <coughs> number two. So when, right after they sing our, that's when we come in again. So we can do it, come on! Let's, let's go. How, about the, how about we lead with one time and then the congregation joins in? Okay, on the second so round. there will always be somebody leading each side, right? Yes. yes. That's right. That's right. You're not no, saying so much. So we'll just look at you and he says, Okay. Gathered here, we're going to go. Gathered here in the midst of the today, and it's one that you've probably heard me tell because I like it so much, and um, <laughs> so it's from this book, A Bucket Full of Dreams, by my good friend and minister, the Reverend Chris Bice, who serves the Tennessee Valley Church, and it, as I was saying, it's a, it's a story I tell sometimes because I think it's a great story for us just to keep in our hearts and souls always. So once upon a time, there was this beautiful and powerful tiger. But one day, she was captured by a mean and cruel man who put her into a cage. And the man kept the cage in the jungle, not far from his house. Every day, he would bring out a bowl of water and some food for the lonely tiger. Sometimes, the tiger would see her own reflection in the bowl. And she would say, my, I must be a beautiful tiger. When the man heard her say this, he would lie and tell her, no, you are not a beautiful tiger. You're very ugly. You're a pitiful creature. Sadly, the tiger would believe the man. Some days after she ate her food, she would walk back and forth in her cage and feel energy and power moving through her body. And she would say, my, I must be a powerful tiger. When the man heard her say this, he would lie and tell her, no, you are weak and puny. You're a pitiful creature. Sadly, the tiger believed the man. Then one day, when the man was nowhere around, a lion happened to walk by the cage. The lion saw the tiger inside and spoke to her. Beautiful and powerful tiger, what are you doing lying in that cage? Oh, do not make fun of me, of me, replied the tiger. I know that I am neither beautiful nor powerful. I'm not making fun of you, said the lion. You are surely the most beautiful and powerful tiger I have ever seen. I am only surprised to see you lying here when you are clearly strong enough to break out of that cage. 
You really think I could break out of here, asked the tiger. Quite easily, I should think, replied the lion. The tiger was not so sure at first. She had been told so many times that she was a weak and pitiful creature. But suddenly, it seemed that she could feel energy and strength moving through her body. She began to pace back and forth in the cage, and then, almost without thought, she leapt against the cage door, and it flew open without any resistance. Once outside, she seemed dazed. That cage didn't even have a lock on it. And I spent so much of my life stuck in there, and the door wasn't even locked. The lion looked at her with soft brown eyes and said, those kinds of traps don't need locks, for it is the lies we believe that keep us in our cages. And it is the truth that sets us free. So I hope that if you're in some kind of cage somewhere and you are not feeling that you have the power and the strength and the beauty to live your life to the fullest, that you find a way to break out of that cage. And those are the kinds of things I am hoping that our young people are learning in our religious education classes, and so we're going to sing them if they want to go. They are welcome to stay if they want to stay, but we're going to sing them on their way to their religious education activities. Go now in peace, go now in peace, May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. <laughs> so this is the time during our weekly service where we accept gratefully our offering. And keep in mind that this church is supported solely through the efforts and donations of our members. We are us, we are the church. And who's collecting the offering today? Thank you, Leslie. Leslie and Phil are gonna come around. And if you have joys or sorrows to share, please put those slips in the offering basket as well. together, it's um, part of our ritual of being together to stay in touch with the important joys and sorrows, personal joys and sorrows in our lives, the sharing of which benefits our sense of community. From Aaron Renfro, Aaron and Jeff are finally in their apartment and settling in. Greetings and hugs to everyone. We miss you. There have been so many goodbyes lately, huh? From Marianne de Grotto, stuck home, recovering from surgery, more difficult than I thought it would be. I miss everybody. I'm thinking of Marianne. And from Leslie, wishing joy and strength for my roommate who has MS and is getting worse, also wishing healing for a bad back. 
for his red bath. Thank you. And Daniel Joy, Lisa has welcomed her new grandson. Grandson. <laughs> I thought it said garden. <laughs> Usually I try to read these before I get up here. <laughs> Lisa has welcomed her new grandson, Sawyer Rawson, Skunks, into the world. Is Lisa here today? She's not here, is she? Both baby and mother are healthy and happy. That's it was a big baby. So it was a nine, nine something pounds. Big baby. Yeah. Wow, you guys are not keeping me informed. I'm not supposed to learn these things up here. <laughs> I'm supposed to hear them. Let's light a, a candle for Dolly this morning, too, because she's, she's at home recovering, but she's... Um, it looks like it might be a slow recovery, but she did tell me that yesterday she was able to get into the pool and do some of her exercises. So that's a huge step, and, um, but she was exhausted afterwards, and I, I get that. Some of you know that I ended up with COVID at the end of my vacation, and um, I was not terribly sick, but it sure takes it out of you. And flow water is Oh, and Flo is at home also after celebrating her 100th birthday. Great, thank you, thank you. And so for all of those joys and sorrows that remain in our heart yet unspoken, we light one last candle. And the reason for sharing all of these joys and sorrows is because we come together and so today we're singing come sing a song with me number 346 and our choir will come back to help us i chose a lot of my favorite hymns for today and also ones that didn't require a pianist <laughs> so i thank laura for accompanying us you may stand if you're willing and able and it's number, as you said, 346.
So change sure seems to be in the air these days. I came to you in a time of change as your minister of 12 years, Reverend Julie was, had left, and you had also uh, lost a, a much beloved past minister who was still a part of your community, Reverend Bob Eddy. Both of those people were friends of mine, and I felt that loss also for you. Um, and in my circle of colleagues, when people move to a different location and you don't see them anymore. I used to see Julie at meetings and all. And, and Bob Eddy used to come to those meetings too. So, so that was a time of change. And then I came and we were looking forward to um, kind of regrouping and the board and I and other leaders looked at your mission, vision, covenant and we looked at it through the lens of Simon, Simon Sinek's golden circle so that we could not only know, know what you were doing and how you were doing it, but why you were doing it. The all important, why do we do what we do? What is our purpose? What's so important about it? And then we build the structure to support the why. So as I leave here, I just want to remind you all of that, that always keep that important why in front of you. And as you evaluate your programming and staffing and you know, what you do in the future, stay, try to stay focused on what's most important for you to be doing as a congregation for one another and for the larger community. Kind of, and, th and then came COVID, which makes me laugh at the idea that we thought we were going to have control of the outcome. <laughs> anyway, I, um, I said that I was going to talk a little bit about the future of our Unitarian Universalist Association, which also involves your future as you connect with that. And I decided to share with you one of the really important lectures that happens at our General Assembly every year. It's called the Ware Lecture from the Ware family of, of Harvard. It's an endowed lecture. And this year, the person invited to give the lecture was Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Are some of you familiar with this person? Um, so Dr. Kendi is an American author. He's written a number of really excellent books. Uh, he's an anti-racist activist and a historian of race and discriminatory policy in America. In July of 2020, he assumed the position of director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. And he was included in Time's Most Influential People of 2020. And there's actually several pages of things that, that are important about him, including the books that he's written. And you may have seen him on Colbert uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, one of his books is, anti, I think it's Anti-Racist Baby. And uh, anyway, he, he is really, really worth paying attention to. So I decided to share. I wish there was more time to share more, but I'm just going to share some things that I thought were important that he said for us as Unitarian Universalists. So um, I, and, and the reason I thought it was important or helpful was I was considering the kind of mixed results that we've had as an association in our efforts at racism. And I think sometimes people sort of misjudge. That they feel like there's resistance to it. But I feel like when um, Dr. Kendi spoke, he lifted up some things that would explain a little bit of what would seem like resistance, but might be more about resistance to the method. And he had done some research, so I wanted to share that with you. So Susan Gray, Reverend Susan Gray, our UUA president, started out asking Dr. Kendi about a statement that he makes in his book, Stamped from the Beginning, A Narrative History of Anti-Black Racist Ideas. And she, ex 
explained that what he stated kind of contradicts what a lot of Unitarian Universalists believe. And her hope was that this time, our efforts, in our efforts, we'll get it right. So Dr. Kendi argues that racist ideas don't create racist systems. You know, we talk about racism and is about systems of oppression. And um, so he's saying that the ideas don't create those systems, that racist ideas prop up, perpetuate, and protect systems of racism, which are systems of power and inequity, but they don't cause them. Therefore, he argues that changing people's minds won't change the systems. And so Reverend Gray asked him to talk a little bit about what he's calling a journey of discovery and what it means to us as we try to live as anti-racists. So then there was this particular story that confirmed something that he had been thinking. When he began his research, Dr. Kendi thought ignorance and hate were causing people to produce racist ideas, and those racist ideas were causing people to produce racist policies. I think a lot of us think um, it's ignorance and hate. We talk a lot about that. Well, he had read this census of 1840, which not too many people knew about. It was a long, long time ago. Um, and it was the first census to include the category of what they then called insanity. Not a word we use now, but it was the first time that they were going to try to take a look at mental illness. So this Harvard-trained budding psychiatrist, Edward Jarvis, studied the data after it was tabulated. He decided to cross-tabulate it with race. He found that black people were 10 times more likely to be found insane in the North than in the South, according to the data. So he speculated on what that might mean, and then he wrote an article, and he, it was submitted and printed in what is now the very prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. And what he had decided to put forth as his, what he had learned, was that it must be because freedom is driving black people insane. <laughs> now, the moment he published it, the pro-slavery theorists who began in earnest in 1837 to articulate this idea that slavery was a positive good grabbed hold of this research as evidence. And Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, whom he called the dean of pro-slavery and slavers, was like, see, now I have proof. Not only is freedom bad for black people, but slavery is good for them. So these pro-slavery enthusiasts started substantiating the system of slavery based on this article. Now the good thing, Dr. Kennedy said with a laugh, is that this Edward Jarvis continued to look at the data, and as a result, he discovered discrepancies. Imagine that. For example, in some northern towns, there were more people categorized as insane than there were black residents. So it didn't add up, and it was, of course, supposed to be the opposite. And all over the North, he was finding these kinds of errors. So he wrote a correction to the Eng New England Journal of Medicine and also another article admitting that he got it wrong. He explained that the data did not support the theory. Now, how do you think the pro-slavery people reacted to this correction? They yes, they ignored it. <laughs> they ignored it totally, as if he never wrote it. And until the end of slavery, until the end of the Civil War, they continued to use that argument. 
that slavery was a positive good. So Kennedy had to ask himself, why would Calhoun and others continue to use this research even though the person who wrote it said it was wrong and published a correction? Well, in 1835, the American Anti-Slavery Society organized a massive mailing campaign to educate people that slavery was an unnecessary evil. Wanting to expose this decades-old belief, they flooded mailboxes across the country, and they were successful. So now, with the old justification that slavery was a necessary evil, no longer holding weight with the advancing abolitionist movement, Dr. Kendi realized that the enslavers' actions had nothing to do with ignorance and hate, but everything to do with their need for this new way to support slavery. They needed a more sophisticated way to substantiate the policies and the power of the enslavers, a more sophisticated racist idea. And this was the theory they chose. You know, we know voter suppression policies today are way more sophisticated than old Jim Crow policies. The policies are getting more and more sophisticated as time goes on. Now, at some point in the conversation, Reverend Gray pointed out that both Charles Sumner, not mentioned yet, an anti-slavery Republican from Massachusetts who was attacked and beaten in the Senate chambers, and John C. Calhoun, who I just mentioned, were both Unitarian. And someone in the assembly yelled, and so was Jarvis. This was a kind of interesting moment as Reverend Gray laughed and our speaker recognized that he was talking about our kin. And she invited him to go on now that he knew he was talking about our family. These and other people on both sides of the slavery issue in those days were associated with Unitarianism in our country. And Unitarianism has gone through a lot of changes since back then also, like theologically. But this is the history about which people in our association speak when they refer to our history of white supremacy in our movement. When, and you may remember some years ago there was an NPR report that came out with the caption and the lead, in Unitarian, Universe, Unitarian Universalists denounce white supremacy make leadership changes. I think that was like around 2017, I'm not sure. Um, so the, then they continued, the Unitarian Universalists are among the most liberal of all religious denominations in America. Activists have denounced what they see as white supremacy in the church and are changing leadership. And that happened. So Dr. Dr. Kendi says yes to the fact that it's important to acknowledge racial progress and also that the ideas, as I said, are getting more sophisticated over time. He says, if we just assume that, we, that once we demonstrate the moral and even obvious bankruptcy of the idea that slavery is a necessary evil, if we just assume that that house of cards is going to fall, then we won't even prepare for the next new and more sophisticated idea that can carry the institution to the Civil War. Reverend Gray pointed out that as people of faith, religious communities across our country, we see part of our job as moral suasion, something that he talks about. We believe people's minds and hearts can be changed. And if we change their ideas, meaning their hearts and minds, we can change the systems. We've kind of operated under that assumption. So if not moral suasion, she asks, what is the role of the church? Or what is our particular role in the anti-racist landscape? So Dr. Kendi wanted to distinguish between the producers of racist ideas and the people who are consuming the ideas. He distinguishes between someone like Calhoun, who produced and circulated the idea of slavery as a positive good, from the people, say, like non-slaveholding white Southerners, who are consuming the ideas 
and assuming it's good for them, even if it's actually contributing to their own poverty. When we distinguish between these two, for the producer of the racist ideas, for the producers of racist ideas, moral suasion is not going to work. Neither will educational suasion. We won't persuade them. We assume they don't know. And if we just demonstrate something like, say, the lack of evidence for election fraud, that they will understand and change their minds. But no, they already know. Just as we have been learning through all of the information in the January 6th hearings. Now, the people who are just hearing it and not producing the ideas can possibly be educated, but not the producers. And Kendi, Kendi thought back to Malcolm X, who he thinks was considering the producers when he said, the effort to reach their moral conscience through moral suasion does not work because they have no morals or conscience, much less moral conscience. <laughs> Dr. Kendi also talked about the way we use words like racist and anti-racist, and I thought this was worth, worth repeating. We have thought of the term racist as an identity, a noun, who a person is, racist or anti-racist. But Ibram finds that people hold both kinds of ideas. He pointed out that abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, also Unitarian, in imagining that slavery had turned black people into brutes, was exhibiting racist thinking. And then when he wanted to challenge slavery, which he did, that was anti-racist. So identifying someone as one or the other may not be helpful. When Dr. Kendi was a guest on Colbert recently, Colbert asked him about the difference between anti-racism as opposed to just being non-racist. And his answer was that to be anti-racist is to recognize the racial groups as equal, to challenge the policies that are leading to inequity and injustice, and to really seek to deconstruct racism and create equality and justice, or equity and justice for all. So Colbert responded, so it's active rather than passive, and he nodded. Reverend Gray asked him, what's giving you hope out there in the movement world? Because this is not sounding very good, is it? Hope for him is from growing more sophisticated in our analysis of power and he thinks he's seeing that. We need to understand what power is, he said. Conservatives, conservators of racism know how to build, wield, and maintain power. People who are about equality and peace have an icky relationship with power. Does that ring true for anybody here? A lot of times we don't like to talk about power, we don't like to claim power. That's what Susan Gray said also. I, I don't know, I, I think that's true. I don't even like to claim power. Sometimes I think, I knew that, but I didn't want to sound like I was pushy or bragging or knew it all, you know? And then later I walk away and think, why didn't I stand up for that more strongly? But what's going on now is a power struggle, pointing out that people wield power with what 20% of the country wants. And some people have the philosophy that power corrupts. And it's a philosophy that causes us to shy away from building and wielding power. Now, by any means necessary, no. Martin Luther King did not believe that. But still, we do, need, we do not need to shy away from building and wielding power. Then he asks, what is power? There's different kinds of power. There's the power to make policy, which is the ultimate form of power, as we've seen. 
And then you have policy managers who carry out and execute the power policies that others make. So he explained that there are these two kinds of power, power making and power managing, and that maybe a policy manager would ask themselves, am I using my power to thwart power that is racist? If you don't have that power, how am I using my power to organize with other people to thwart the power of those who are making and managing policy and power? So we need to be extremely strategic. Those trying to conserve the structure of racism and other kinds of oppression, which there are many right now, are saying publicly that this is important, that we need to um, be strategic. And actually, the publicly part is something different. He said that he is not as worried about what people are saying and doing publicly as he is with the outcome from what they're doing behind the scenes. So this content was really rich. And Susan Gray was able to bring the conversation around to issues which are particular to Unitarian Universalists. Because of the, the, the theology and ideas that are pretty much inherent in our tradition. And I was able to identify some of what I have sensed as barriers to our UUA struggle to come together around a vision for our anti-racist work and our desire to create a world that is, has justice, equity, and compassion for all in all of our relationships. I thought about some things about the history of this congregation. The plaque outside. I, I can only imagine what some of you who've been around a long time felt when Roe v. Wade was reversed. The sacrifice, the organizing, the strategy, the hard work that people in this congregation participated in, escorting women, helping make it possible for women to have the choice that was their right. And then the sacrifice was huge. People died. And I know that this congregation takes that personally. And so I thought of you, I've been thinking of you since that time. The things that are happening now are scary and heartbreaking. And to have some hope that we can be strategic, that we can unite, that we can garner community, other people in the community. I think the work that this congregation is doing with Just Pensacola is really important. I know that the, some of the churches we're involved with are not going to get involved in all the particular things that we get involved with because they're, they have, hold a lot of different theological beliefs. I'm sure around abortion, they're not going to coalesce. But there are some things that they are doing and where we can have an influence on things that are consistent with our values. Being part of a community, because we gotta be bigger. There's not enough of us in one little Pensacola UU church to make a huge difference. We've gotta find ways to connect with larger groups. It takes money, it takes hard work, and some of you who've been through some of those struggles know that. So I, I like to think that we're going to move forward and with our anti-oppression work and our Unitarian Universalist Association. I'm sure we will. We've struggled before. There are a lot of different ideas, but, but some of the things that um, Dr. Kendi brought to surface, I thought, these are reasons that we can't kind of get ourselves together sometimes, and we argue and squabble with each other, which is not helpful. So my, my hope knowing that we are not perfect, is that we all have the ability to grow and change and learn new things and to grow in our understanding of how to be part of a greater movement that is seeking essential transformation. May it be so.
Thank you. Thank you. Please rise and body your spirit. We're going to sing one more step, number circle bigger. Do not think we are finished, says Albright Fulson. Oh no, we will never be finished, never just done, until the light of justice is lit behind every eye. Let us go in peace, knowing we are loved, knowing that we are held in a large embrace of love. That's the universalist belief. <laughs>